Hello and welcome to Teach Online TV. My name is Tyler Basu and I am joined by a very special guest today. Her name is Dory Clark and she is a marketing strategy consultant, a professional speaker, an online course creator, a contributor to Harvard Business Review, Time, Entrepreneur, and many other publications. Uh, and she helps people position themselves as experts uh, in their industry. And in fact, she's created an entire program that teaches people how to do that. Uh, so Dory, thank you so much for your time. I am excited to, uh, to dive into this topic with you. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate it. It's great to talk with you. Uh, now, I know I gave away some of the highlights there, but if you could just take a minute or two to tell us um, how, how you got into this. How did you become a marketing consultant? How did you become, you know, the quote unquote, uh, go to expert uh, on your, uh, your area of expertise? Well, I, Tyler, 10 years ago, I started my marketing consulting business. And when I went into the marketplace and launched, I, I had this like sudden horrifying revelation, which is that everyone in the world was a marketing consultant. <laughs> and I somehow had to distinguish myself. And people were, you know, they'd ask me, well, what kind of clients do you work with? And what do you specialize in? And I, I just had no idea. I had no way to answer that. I had no way to really um, show how I was different. And I, I realized, you know, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to develop that if I am going to be successful. And so I set upon a quest, basically, to try to understand out out of the people in the business world and elsewhere who were really successful the people who were the most successful in their industry what did they do what, what did they do to get recognized how did they come up with the ideas they got known for what were their secrets and so part of my background I used to be a professional journalist and so I really applied that lens to it and so uh, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called stand out which was really trying to break that process down. I interviewed more than 50 top thought leaders across a spectrum of different fields and distilled down their best practices so that regular professionals could follow that. And so I, uh, as, as part of that process, first I created the book Stand Out, and then I, I got a lot of feedback from people that they were interested in trying to understand more how they could apply the principles to their own life. And that's why I ended up developing my online course, Recognized Expert. Okay, no, that's awesome. So it's been uh, it's it's been quite a journey, and uh, you know, I think that what happened in those first few years of you becoming that marketing uh, consultant and then realizing there's a lot of marketing consultants that happens in a lot of professions. Like I, I'm thinking of, you know, especially service based service based professions, financial planners, realtors. Like how how do you differentiate yourself from the other people that are offering the same service? And so it, it seems like. Uh, the turning point for you or when you really started to pick up momentum was when you got clear on, you know, who you were trying to serve and then you positioned yourself as that person most capable of serving them. So could you just walk us through that, that process a little bit? When did you go from, you know, general uh, marketing consultant to something a little bit more specific than that? Well, I think that if there's a, a certain group of people, and I count myself among them, for whom it is really hard, painfully hard, in fact, to, uh, to to choose, to willfully narrow yourself down because you're interested in so many things, you're kind of a renaissance person. And so one of the things that, that I really preach is that if if that seems hard to you, if you you know don't really want you know want to, to pick a niche, you can actually let a, a niche pick you. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I do think it's important in the marketplace to have some special area that you're known for. Otherwise, it's just really hard for people to know who to even send you as a potential client or a potential referral. But what, what you can do is to follow a strategy of what the author Peter Sims calls little bets. And so that means that you can essentially float a lot of small, low-risk trial balloons and then observe and evaluate to see what in the marketplace is resonating. And just as one example, it could be something as simple as writing blog posts on a variety of different topics in your field and mm -hmm. seeing which one gets picked up, which one gains traction, which one has the most shares or the most comments, and then saying, oh, you know, this seems to be what the market is responding to. Maybe I'll do more of that. And you just continue to move in that direction as you get audience feedback. Mm, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. So put some stuff out there, put some content out there. Uh, and see which of it gets the most traction uh, among your audience or among your, your followers, I guess. So when it comes to uh, leveraging the internet to really to position ourselves, because I mean, the, one of the great things about doing business online and creating products and services that we can sell online is 
we can reach people from all over the world. We can reach customers from all over the world. But we're also competing with people from from all over the world as well. Um, so what are what are some of the things that you've done um, to help position yourself as an expert on on your areas of expertise? Uh, you know, what were some of the you know two or three key things that you've been doing consistently, or that you really noticed made a big difference um, from a branding perspective and from a credibility perspective for you? Well, Tyler, one of the key concepts that I teach in the Recognized Expert course is that in order to, to really be known as a thought leader in your industry or in your field, there are three key components that you have to have. The first one is content creation, the second is social proof, and the third is your network. And basically what I mean by that, and in the course we actually walk people through each of these steps so that they can learn where they're strong and should double down and where they're a little bit weaker and need to focus is that first of all for content creation and this could take lots of forms this could be blogging or podcasts or giving speeches or whatever but the basic idea here is that if you do not share your ideas in some form with the world mm. no one will know what your ideas are <laughs> and so they, they don't know if you're any good yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's pretty basic but yet a lot of people don't think of it that way or they don't do it but so sharing sharing your ideas content creation is the first kind of cornerstone piece the second one social proof is essentially a way of giving the world a shortcut so that they are more likely to listen to you and you know social proof is a term from psychology it essentially means what are what are the credibility markers that you attach to yourself so that people are willing to listen to you because you know we all know these days that there there's a ton of noise there's so much coming at you you know fake news all of that you don't really know who to listen to sometimes and so it makes it enormously easier for the public and for your audience, if you are able to show them that you have been pre-qualified and pre-vetted as credible so that they can say, oh, OK, that's, you know, that's great. I'll listen to her. And that, that can be a lot of different things. It could be anything from you are a blogger for a respected publication. It could be that you are a board member of a professional association. It could be that you worked for a company previously that's considered you know, this sort of exemplar in your field any of those types of things, but having social proof is, is very powerful. And the third and final piece is about your network. And your network is valuable on multiple fronts. Um, the first one, of course, is that they are a kind of mirror for you. They can help reflect back what's a good idea, what's not such a good idea, how do you improve it? Um, they're, they're kind of your first trusted focus group, but they also have the function that if you have a, a good network, they can be your earliest ambassadors. And if you do have that good idea, they can help you spread it to the world. So those are the three components of being a recognized expert. Mm, okay, th th those are great points. And you know, there's uh, there's uh, there's overlap between those three things as well, which I think is really good. I mean, as, let's say you're creating content, uh, which was the first step that you shared. If you're creating content on your own blog, or you know, you're writing a book, or you're creating a course, like that's all different forms of content. But you could easily create content for other platforms as well. You could write for some of those other publications. So now you've got social proof and content in one step. You could reach out to another expert, get a quote from them, interview them, put that in. Now you're doing three things and you know at once. Like they all complement each other very well. Very astute. That's exactly right. Yes, you want to try to kill as many birds with one stone as you can. It makes your life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, for sure. There's only so much time we we have in, in one day, right? Um, if somebody's trying to uh, you know pick where to start, let's say they know they need to share their message, they have an area of expertise, and they want to they want to share their ideas, share their message, share their advice with the world, but they're just feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I mean, they're looking at all the different social media options that are out there, the different types of content. Like they they could be writing, they could be doing videos, they could be doing podcasts. You mentioned uh, you know the different content types. But what, what would be, um, how would you suggest somebody choose where to start? Uh, and then from there, how would they, you know, g gradually get into those other forms of content? Yeah. So I think to a, to a certain extent, because, because really you do need all three components of content, um, social proof and network to, to a certain extent, 
one answer is that you can start with a place that you feel the most comfortable. I think that most people are probably drawn to one approach more than the others. And if that's, if that's the case, go for it. Do what feels natural. If you're a people person, you like connecting, great. Start there, do that. That will actually begin to give you a pretty good toehold. So by way of example, if networking is your primary strategy, um, you know, you start to get to know people in your field, you make friends, etc. you build up trust. Oh, guess what? One of your contacts is a blogger for a prominent publication. And guess what? He's willing to introduce you. And so that begins mm -hmm. to to get you on the path to uh, to social proof and to content creation right there. Um, but if if you literally have no preferences among you know any of these uh, other things, I would say probably the best starting place would be content creation. And the reason that I say that is that at a very foundational level, that act of putting your ideas on paper or you know video or whatever your medium is, forces you to think more clearly about them so that you can mm. convey it properly to other people. So it sharpens your own ideas and makes you better at thinking and, and talking to other people. And that is kind of a foundational element that is going to be useful with everything else that you do. Okay, no, that, that's great advice. Uh, now, one thing we, we try to, uh, I mean, we encourage course creators to be creating free content as well. A lot of people uh, use Thinkific and then they set up an online course and they're charging for that course, but they don't have the marketing strategy component figured out yet. And so we'll often tell them, well, you should probably, you know, get some content out there, do some blogging, go get on some podcasts, do some interviews, make some videos. Um, in your experience, what has been a good way to bridge the gap from that free content to your paid offers, whether you, you, you know, whether you're a coach or a consultant, or you've got an online course, something that you're charging for. And if you're putting the free content online, and that's what's attracting an audience to you, uh, what have you found is a good way to, to bridge the gap and take somebody who consumes your free stuff to uh, to paying uh, for some of your 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 higher priced products? Or yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts about that. One, which I think is implicit in what you're saying, but I just wanted to make it explicit, is that in creating free content, it it serves a couple of valuable purposes. One, of course, is just overall name recognition, which is which is great. You know, people are going to trust you more if they've heard your name multiple times when, when it comes to a certain topic. But what you especially want to do is find ways to build it in so that if people are reading an article of yours online or if they're listening to your podcast or something like that, you are driving them to your website so that they can download a, a so-called lead magnet, some kind of a giveaway, so that you can get their email address and be able to stay in touch with them. Because otherwise, it, you know, I can't even tell you how many, how many iterations it would take of somebody – you know, even it, let's let's pretend it's Forbes or whatever. I, how many times would it take for somebody to read an article by you in Forbes if they didn't even know your name, and have it actually stick so that they're like, oh yeah, that Tyler guy. Probably ten, probably fifty for them right. to really notice. So that's why it's so important for you to get their email address and be in deeper touch with them, more frequent touch with them, because it means that that one article actually may be able to lead to a longer term relationship. Uh, because, you know, if you're in somebody's inbox regularly, they're listening, they're paying attention, they know who you are. The second piece that I'll just mention briefly is the importance, uh, you know, also implicit, but, but very essential to mention of consistency in this process. I really doubled down on a content creation strategy starting in 2010. And I, you know, I will tell you, I, I charted it and I persisted because I, I found the process of content creation to be valuable, um, you know, from a social proof perspective, because I was blogging for relatively high profile publications from a networking perspective, as you indicated, because I was interviewing cool people and, and using that to build relationships. So I kept doing it, even though I was not showing immediate results when it came to inbound inquiries from it. But I, because I was patient on, you know, because mm. I was getting results on these other fronts, I was able to do it so that now I do regularly get inbound inquiries because people have read an article or something like that. They're reaching out, but I will tell you, it actually takes, um, for me, it took between two and three years and between two and 300 articles that I had out there for free in the public domain before on a regular basis, people began reaching out to me. Mm. Uh, so it, it just, it takes a lot of volume and a lot of consistency and many people are not patient enough to do that. Uh, but if you do, the, the, the process does work.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. This is a, you know, building a brand and establishing establishing yourself as an expert is a long term strategy. It doesn't happen, you know, overnight. You do got to put in the time to create enough content and to provide enough value to other people and build up that trust among them uh, and get them on an email list, as you indicated, uh, because otherwise, you know, they the chances of them coming across your article on a publication or even on your own website and then coming back to your website and you know seeing you many times is unlikely unless you've got a direct line of communication to them and so that's why getting them on your newsletter is so important um you did you touched on something earlier as well which i think is really important is that the 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 act of creating content helps you become better at sharing your message you know because i think when you put something online i mean it's uh it's now receptive to to judgment criticism like people might say well you know i don't like the way you said that why'd you say it that way or i, I don't agree with you there um you're getting real feedback so how has uh should, should somebody shy away from feedback if let's say they're just getting started with sharing their message and then somebody gives them a hard time is should they be discouraged by that or what what should they do next you know i actually wrote a piece about this um maybe a year year or so ago for the harvard business review and they asked me uh, they were doing a special section on feedback, and they reached out. They said, "Hey, Dory, would you do a piece on, uh, on you know, how to receive feedback graciously, or something like that?" And, <laughs> and I said, "You know, I actually have a different idea. Uh, would you mind if I did a piece about uh, about how you shouldn't listen to feedback?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, "Okay, sure." Uh, so, so, so it's out there. Uh, if people want to, you know, Google Dory Clark Harvard Business Review feedback, uh, you can find it. But um, but you know my my basic premise with that is that there are a lot of people out there who just really have too much time on their hands and they mm. they have it in their head these are these are the people that you know get their thrills in life from writing Yelp reviews that uh, that you know they are doing the world a favor by providing their feedback on anything and everything you know your course or your course idea or whatever whatever and the the truth is if if you have not as a creator asked for someone's opinion then i i think that it's actually important to ignore a lot of that feedback now you know that being said of course if if someone has paid money and has taken your course and if for some reason they're dissatisfied then as a customer service matter it is important uh to talk to them to understand to make sure you know oh okay well you know are my marketing materials in alignment with the course like did i deliver properly what i what I was telling people I would deliver or, or things like that. But, you know, by and large, there are going to be um, people out there that do not have an informed opinion about it. And that stops a lot of people. And I think it's really sad because, of course, as human beings, we are sensitive. And when somebody is slagging on us, we're we're going to feel bad about it. I mean, I'll get a, I'll get an email from somebody, you know, saying something critical. And, you know, I'll be like thinking about it all day in the back of my mind. And that's not helpful. And right. So I think that if we are, you know, we can't turn off our brains, but I think that if we consciously adopt the philosophy that if I didn't ask for your opinion, I don't want your opinion, mm -hmm. I actually think it's a much healthier place to come from because it gives us the creative confidence enough to allow ourselves to create something that we think is valuable to share with the world. Mm, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, and I think that as you know, as you create more content and as more people see your content, just you know, naturally, uh, let's say, I don't know, five percent of the people who come across your stuff don't like it. Well, if you're reaching a lot more people, that five percent is going to feel a lot bigger because um, there's just more people in it. But I really like your advice of if it's you know, if it's constructive feedback, especially if it's feedback from customers that have paid you then perhaps it's more worth paying attention to but it's just if it's just criticism from people you you don't even really know or um then don't 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 worry too much about it don't spend too much time on that yeah absolutely and and yeah i, I think you know the, the construct the constructivity of it is is really important i mean you know i'll give i'll give you one example um one uh, one of my students uh commented commented to me from my recognized expert course he was so sweet about it he said oh the course is so good i love it i love it he said the one thing i wish is that i could watch these videos on my mobile device and i'm like oh i didn't check that 
box. Mm. You can't latch it on the box. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, Alexander. And so, uh, so I went back in and I just shake the box on my course. And of course, you know, I think it allows you to do that. So anyway, I was like, oh, okay, that was really helpful feedback because yeah, I just, I just missed that. And sorry, I can fix that. Um, that so you know, done, done, and done. Yeah. Uh, but you, you do get a lot of, uh, a lot of people sometimes that. Uh, you know, they just they, they, they fancy themselves the critic, and it's like you know, dude, you don't you don't write for the New Yorker. Like, just stop. Mm -hmm. Um, now we've touched on this a little bit, um, but you know, the importance of of uh, networking, interviewing people, being featured on some of those publications that uh, you know perhaps your target audience or your already your audience reads because you want to get in front of them. Um, now, how how would you uh, suggest somebody? go about finding where their target target audience hangs out online like if they're trying to establish their presence online they're trying to be the go-to expert on their area of expertise what are some ways that they can find where the people who are interested in that topic uh hang out on the internet so that they know they know that they're sharing their message in the right places yeah, so as, as a starting point here, I would really adopt essentially the kind of, you know, focus group mentality, which is that hopefully you already have either some customers now or some, you know, friends or people that you know who fit the profile of your ideal target. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I hope everyone who's creating a course knows at least a few people that would represent their uh, their target audience. And so you go to those people and, you know, you, you basically just want to do a qualitative interview. You want to say, OK, um, when you are looking for, for news about kiteboarding or drone flying or uh, about, you know, Dalmatian breeding, where do you go? What conferences do you attend? What websites do you read? What blogs do you subscribe to? What podcasts do you listen to? What Twitter feeds do you follow? I mean, you know, all these, all these kinds of things. And you just want to comprehensively follow those things. And then that can be the trail of breadcrumbs. Um, hopefully you can ask them, to introduce you to uh, to more people, so you can you know get a decent sized enough qualitative sample to, to do all that. But then once you you start subscribing to those things and listening, you're going to begin to pick up by osmosis. You know this blog is going to be quoting that blog, and you know that podcast is going to be talking about that you know that guy with a really big Twitter following, and you can begin mm -hmm. to map out the ecosystem yourself. But to start with, you just need a, a few, just even a handful of your ideal clients, your ideal customer, and you just interview the heck out of them and start to get clues about where they're looking and who they pay attention to. Mm, okay, great advice. What would you say are some of the uh, the biggest mistakes that you've seen people make as they're trying to establish their brands, um, establish themselves as experts? What are some of the, the no-nos or uh, even from your own experience or from things that you've seen other people do? But what, what would you say, what mistakes would you would you save us from? Yeah, well, you know, one of one of the big ones that I see, Tyler, is that you know, because you do, you do need these three components of being a recognized expert, what I often see, sometimes people get, you know, and they're, they're talented, they're smart, they're accomplished professionals, and they say, why am I not breaking through? Why mm -hmm. am I hitting a ceiling? They get so frustrated. They say, oh, I've tried everything. And w once you parse it, once you peel it back, you begin to realize that oftentimes what is happening is that they are over-indexing on their favorite form of being a recognized expert you know oh. they just they network and they network and they network and that's great they love networking they're good at it but if you do all of that and none of the other stuff you end up with a problem where you know everyone in creation they might like you they might think you're a great guy oh tyler he's so <laughs> fun i like to invite him to all my parties he's wonderful but if you're not creating content and sharing your ideas they have no idea what you do they have no idea what kind of customers to refer to you because mm. you're just tyler that fun nice guy and you have to be willing not just to play to your strengths but also to address your weaknesses or the things that you like less well so that you can get them all pushed forward to the point where you have you have the three legs of the stool of content creation social proof and network so that people will look at you and say yeah that that is a fully formed expert let's let's listen to him or let's listen to her right right 
That's a great point. Um, now, I'd like to uh, to get you a little bit of advice from you uh, in terms of building your team and surrounding you know yourself with people that can help you build your brand. Um, I think especially online, it's easy to think that a lot of uh, that a lot of individuals and experts are 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 doing it alone. Like you look at you know very strong personal brands like uh, like Lewis Howes, for example, or Marie Forleo, or you know even Gary Vaynerchuk. Some of these names. Um, even though it's 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 a personal brand, people recognize that name. Um, those people aren't doing every single activity to to build that brand and to run their business. They've got some people in place to help them. So, um, at what point do you think it makes sense for you know a a, a solopreneur, maybe a coach, a consultant, uh, an online course creator, to start uh, surrounding themselves or to start getting the help of other people? Um, when do you think that that makes sense for them and do you have any tips for them uh, as they approach that that phase of their business? Yeah, so I, I do have a few thoughts about this. I mean, one is that I, I am a, a big fan of, you know, taking taking a lean approach to it. I mean, I, I think that um, it's actually a good impulse for, uh, you know, for solopreneurs or, or for people who are, you know, starting businesses or things like that, not to uh, staff up in a big way and like, oh, if I'm going to be a business person, I need to have a, you know, full time this and a full time that you do not want to have a lot of overhead. That is a, uh, a dangerous thing to have before you have predictable cash flow. And so I'm, you know, I'm a big fan. Yes, get help, but get help in a flexible way. Use a virtual assistant or, yeah. you know, some kind of part time help. So so that you can expand and contract as you need to. Um, that's that's the first thing. You don't want to set yourself up uh, in a way that you're you're putting your business at, at risk before it's really ready for it. Um, one of the one of the easiest starting places, um, but which a lot of people overlook, and I, I would really recommend this, is very basic level for. Two, two weeks, let's say you can, you know, a month if you want to be really thorough, but for two weeks at least, literally just keep a time diary, keep a chart of how exactly you are spending your time. Maybe, you know, every few hours you can just write down, oh, I did that for 15 minutes, I did that for half an hour, etc. You keep this chart. Um, you can actually download a really nice one. My friend Laura Vanderkam, who is a uh, sort of productivity expert. Her last name is V-A-N-D-E-R-K-A-M. So you can just Google Laura Vanderkam and uh, you can you can download it. But she has a spreadsheet that, that enables you to track this pretty effectively. And what is, uh, what's so helpful about that is that you begin to see, okay, what am I really spending time on as opposed to what I imagine I'm spending time on? And out of those things, what are... E what are the, the things that cause me the most trouble or that I hate the most or that would just be easy to delegate? And once you have that list, you can then begin to work backwards and say, oh, okay, well, a regular VA could do this. Maybe I need a specialized VA or a specialized professional. You know, like if you're spending, uh, you know, 10 hours a week doing video editing, maybe that's not the best use of your time. Maybe you should mm -hmm. say, you know what, I should just, I should just contract out. I should just get that, you know, gone. And you can begin to think strategically about what skills you need to, uh, to buy to have on your extended team. Right, right. That that makes sense. And you bring up a good point that uh, it, you know we can we can keep it lean, and in fact we should keep it lean. And because of you know the internet and and you, there's you know plenty of websites and marketplaces where we can find talented people from around the world who can do things for us. Uh, and it's often it's not even it's it's nowhere near as expensive as we thought it might be. And so it makes a lot of sense where if you know you're spending a lot of your time on an activity that you could delegate and you could use that time to make more money or create more products or work with more clients, then it makes sense to, uh, to delegate that activity. Um, now, I, as you know, uh, Thinkific's audience are uh, primarily online course creators or people who are thinking of creating an online course. Uh, now, you've been, uh, you know, working uh, offline, let's say, or, you, you know, you're going out and speaking in the real world, consulting in, in the real world, uh, creating content consistently for many years now, writing articles, publishing books. Um, I'm curious, though, when, when did when did you decide to get into creating courses and why? Why did you decide to create online courses? Well, I think like a lot of people who have taught 
uh, college or graduate school courses, there's something fundamentally appealing about doing an online course in the sense of the reach that you can have. Um, you know, famously, uh, Sebastian Thrun, who was a tenured Stanford professor, ended up leaving his position because the first class online that he taught managed to enroll 160,000 people, and he wow. was like, OMG, uh, that's a lot more people than I can ever <laughs> reach in like 50 lifetimes at, at Stanford. You know, yeah. let's see where this goes. And uh, and so he devoted himself full time to the idea of online courses. And so similarly, uh, the fact that, that you're really able to go at scale and connect with people is is pretty exciting. And, you know, from from a, a perspective as, you know, so that's, that's sort of an impact perspective. As an entrepreneur, um, of course, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's great opportunity for remuneration. I spend a lot of time giving keynote talks, um, like a lot of them, uh, when I, uh, I, I haven't actually tallied the number yet for 2016, but for 2014, I gave 61 uh, talks. And in 2015, it was 74 talks. So I was spending a significant portion of my life on the road, on airplanes, and I realized, like, whoa, that's that's all that's almost too much, and mm -hmm. I need to to scale back and have a more sane form of life. And I began thinking, what would enable me to do that? What would enable me to continue reaching people, to continue making money, uh, but to, to do it more comfortably, to do it from home? And, uh, you know, I mean, I still get plenty of talks. I still travel, but I just didn't want to be doing it every week, like twice a week. Right. And so, uh, so online courses were, were a very, um, you know, they, they presented a very favorable profile there that I, that I wanted to uh, really explore in depth. Okay, no, that, that that makes sense. And so you're able to reach a lot more people now and you don't have to trade your time or physically get somewhere, physically travel somewhere in order to uh, to teach someone or to, to, to share some value with somebody. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, Dory, this is uh, this has been a pleasure. Um, you know, we've covered quite a bit here. Uh, you've got so much expertise, and I think this will be really helpful uh, for our audience. Are there any last words of encouragement that you'd like to give to somebody who, you know, they, they know that they have experience, they know that they have the ability to pass on some knowledge to somebody else, but they just haven't taken those steps uh, to build a business around their area of expertise yet? Or is there any words of encouragement or, or first action steps that they could take? Well, I have uh, I have a couple, so so thank you, Tyler. Uh, the f the first one is that I I found the the actual course creation process to be really powerful because you have to you have to really step back and think out of all the work that you do, which for, you know for many people, let's say you've been a professional service provider, oftentimes is bespoke and very targeted to individuals. It actually is very helpful to you as a professional to think through creating a course because what you have to, to do is really uh, take take a look at the fundamental principles and ask yourself you know what is essential here what do people need to do to, to know what is the framework and putting that uh, together so that it is intelligible for other people makes you better and smarter uh, mm -hmm. so I think that that's extraordinarily valuable and thinkific of course one of the things I love about it is that the uh, the technical setup you have the back end setup just makes it so easy really really easy to be able to sort of plunk in your materials and shift them around it is so fast and so uh, seamless once once you intellectually decide what should be in your course to actually put it in there so the barriers for creating it are very low and the last thing that I'll mention is that if folks watching this are interested in trying to uh, to you know to really think about what is your breakthrough idea you know how to, obviously you kind of know your area of interest but but if you really want to dive in and, and understand, you know, what is my unique spin on this? What is my angle? What is the piece I want to contribute that's different? Um, I actually have a free resource that might be valuable uh, to folks. I created a 42-page self-assessment uh, from based on my book, Stand Out, and my course, Recognized Expert, and uh, it's available for free on my website. Um, folks can download it, and it really walks you step-by-step -step through how to develop your breakthrough idea and then build a following around it, which, of course, is critical if you're working to build a course and sell it and create your audience. Uh, so you can go to doryclark.com slash thinkific. It's D-O-R-I-E-C-L-A-R-K dot com slash thinkific and you can download it for free. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dory. And I'll make sure we link to that uh, below the video as well so people can easily find that resource. Uh, thank you again for your time. This has been a pleasure, and uh, I wish you all the best. Hey, thank you so much, Tyler.